Hello and welcome. Your typical person that purchases an electric car brings it home and they just initially charge the car with the mobile connector that it came with. And they plug into a standard household outlet or maybe they have a higher power 220 in their garage, something to that effect. Uh, eventually, a lot of those people also have a wall connector installed where it's maybe hardwired directly into their home. Well, in my case, I have a NEMA 1450 outlet that I installed and I normally charge my car directly from the house with that outlet. Well, in a project that I did in 2021, which I'll link a card here above to a video I made, and my travel trailer now has 2,650 watts of rated solar panels on the roof. When we're not camping, I want that electricity to be useful to me, and what better place to send it than the electric car? It's a very easy place to send electricity to, it constantly needs some, and it can take as much as I can throw at it pretty much compared to what the RV can send. In this case, I have a cord right here that is going to my RV and another cord up here that is going to that NEMA 1450 outlet that's plugged into the side of my house. So I'm able to charge from either source. So in today's video, I'm gonna give a little bit more detail about this electrical wiring that I have set up here in my garage. And then I will go to my computer and we'll go over the uh, results from 2022 and all of the electricity that the solar panels generated from the trailer how much of that went into the car and to you know useful range in the car. Now, first off, you can see that there are two handles here and I have them hanging on this hook. And so what I do is this one right here is going to the house. And so I can just simply plug that in. And then if I want to be able to charge from the RV, then I just plug in the other one as well. And then when the other one, when it's not being used, it just stays there on this hook. This metal bar that is up here is going across the entirety of the width of my garage. And I covered that in a video a couple of years ago, and I'll put a card above as well to that, where I go over the best home electric vehicle charging setup. Now in that video, I used to have a Nissan Leaf sitting right here, and I've sold that because I didn't need it, we didn't drive enough. And so right now we have our boat here, which I've also included in some videos in the past when we have towed this boat with my Model S to the reservoir. So if you're interested in watching that, I'll put a card above there as well. Now, this charging infrastructure is kind of, you can see there's a couple of different wires going back and forth. So I'm gonna go grab the camera now and let's, I'm gonna give you more detail about why I have the wires routed the way I do. We have the wires over here coming from the RV and those are the front leading edge of the solar panels on the roof of the trailer. Along the side of the trailer here, you can see this wire going into the house. And this is a 50 amp RV extension cord. It's a Camco 30 foot cord. And I have talked about that in my best Tesla charging adapters video, which I'll put a card above as well for that. So this is going up under the RV cover. Let's go over there and I'll show you what that looks like. Under the cover, the cord is going up here into the battery storage compartment that came with our Lance 2185. On the inside of this compartment, I have a NEMA 1450 outlet installed that's going into the electrical system of the travel trailer. That cord then proceeds to come over here and into the window of my garage. And that cord is coming into the house here. And because it's so thick, I have the remainder of the window opening stuffed with foam to keep the cold air out and the rain. That cord is then coming into my garage and I have it going overhead, going across and it's hanging from the garage door opener motor and it's going across my garage over to here. The reason why I have the cord coming way over here across the garage instead of just to the back of the car is because I used to actually only use one charger and I would adjust and plug in to either the extension cord or to the wall depending on the charge source. The reason why I did that is because what I use to charge the car is a Juicebox Pro 40 and it's, it's Wi-Fi connected and it allows me to adjust the amps by one amp increment. And the reason why I did that is because for a long time in 2022, the car did not allow me to adjust the amps that it was pulling unless you were sitting in the car physically. And because I'm doing this day in and day out, and I even like to adjust the amps throughout the day, depending on the so solar output, I wanted to be able to just do it through the app on my phone or from a desktop computer. The mobile connector that comes with Tesla's doesn't have any intelligence into it. You just plug it in and I guess it's got the intelligence of knowing what connector it's connected to and it just goes straight to the max amperage of that or following the 80% rule. And that's not what I wanted. I wanted more fine-tuned precision. Now, late in 2022, we upgraded the MCU on our Tesla and that upgraded us to ver uh, version firmware 11. And that enabled me to adjust the amps on my app, on my phone. So that is now the methodology that I use. And so now I use two chargers. I use the Juicebox Pro 40 when I'm coming off of the trailer. 
and I use a mobile connector for when I'm going from the, the house, from the grid, because it needs you know, less intelligence. I just let it go straight to the max of 40 amps and it just charges at that rate. Now something I've found is that the car detects which connector it's plugged into and it will automatically go to the last set point of amps based on that. So that's actually a really convenient thing because a lot of times my wife just plugs it in and I, when I had the one charger coming off of two sources, I made sure that that charger never went over 20 amps even though I was plugged into the house because if my wife plugged it in and I didn't know about it, it would exceed the RV's capabilities which is 20 amps and it would go straight to 40 and then it would uh, you know, run past the limits on the trailer and make the inverters shut down. So it, this has been a, a, an evolution of progress of changing um, options based on the technology and software updates and things like that. Right now I am charging the car from this Mi Gear mobile connector from the NEMA 1450 outlet in the house and I, I did a review video about this and I'm still testing it doing some long-term testing. If you're interested in watching that I'll put a link in the description below to that video. So this is the end of that extension cord that's coming from the RV and you can see that that cord is actually going up through a hole in the shelf and that's going to the Juicebox Pro 40 above. The cord from the Juicebox Pro 40 is coming out and I have it just hung on some hooks along the side of the garage door opening rail and then it's coming to this metal bar that goes across the front of the garage. That juice box cord is 25 feet long, which is more than I need, so I have some excess looped right here. And then the Mi Gear mobile connector cord is coming and joining, and they're both coming across this metal bar hanging from it and coming over here to this hook to be ready for me to use depending on the charge source that I desire. When I get around to it, I'll probably reroute the extension cord and instead of going across to the garage, I'll just have it come along the wall and behind the boat here. And then I'll have the mobile connector plugged into it here and that will just be able to go straight into the car. That is my wiring setup. And now let me show you how I administer this on my phone. When I'm at my computer, I will often just keep this browser tab open, which is the Victron monitoring portal. And I just keep my eye on the discharging uh, quantity here, the current state of charge of the battery. Over here is the amount of electricity coming in from the solar panels on the RV. And this is the amount going out to the Tesla right now. And I also keep my eye on this battery temperature when it's in the middle of the winter or the heat of the summer. And I uh, adjust the HVAC system or the, the mini split in the trailer when needed to adjust the, the temperature of the batteries. But a lot of times I'm not at my computer. And so in that case, I look here at the app on my phone, which as you can see, pretty much has all of the same information. It looks much the same way. It's just more of a vertical orientation. And when I look at this, if I make a determination like, hmm, the RV batteries are discharged sufficiently and I would like to just keep it maintained as it is now. I then switch over to my Tesla app and I can adjust the amps right here. And as I do that, I can switch back over to the Victron app and I can see correspondingly the AC loads up here in the top right corner, those lower. And I can see that the discharging over here on the RV battery is now far less, it's only 171 watts, which at that rate, it's going to be discharging quite slowly. And the majority of the energy going to the Tesla is coming straight from the RV solar panels. I desire that. I, I want the batteries on the trailer just, you know, for health and longevity to be used minimally. So they're there as the minor buffer, but I want the majority of the electricity just to pass straight through the inverters and to my Tesla's battery instead. In the summer, the RV can output enough electricity in a day that it will nearly fully charge the RV battery in, in twice over. And so I definitely need to keep it going into the Tesla whenever we can, but because it's a car and sometimes gets driven, uh, that means that I actually try to keep the RV battery more to a minimum than uh, than full. So you can see right now it's at 40% and I actually would generally keep it closer to 20% during the day. And so that way, if my wife just decides to unplug the car and go somewhere in it, that I now have the maximum amount of time before the solar panels fill up the RV batteries. Now, the minimum amount that the Tesla will let me go is five amps. And as you can see, as it adjusts down to that, that becomes one kilowatt or just over one kilowatt at 240 volts. If we switch back over here, you'll see the amount of AC loads is now 1139 watts. And th there are times in the day when obviously the solar panels are not outputting over that amount, like first thing in the morning and later in the day, you know, going into the evening. 
So in those times when it gets down to the point that the, the RV battery is low enough, say 20%, then I go ahead and stop the Tesla charging and just let the remainder of the solar energy of the day go into the RV batteries. Conversely, in the next morning, I don't start charging the car right away. I wait until the solar output is above 500 watts, maybe up to 1,000, and then I'll start charging the Tesla and then reduce the RV battery percentage again by charging the car faster than the solar is producing, and that pulls it back down. The maximum amount of energy that I can pull from the trailer at the same time is about 4,800 watts. Each inverter is rated for 2,400 watts continuous. That can vary depending on the temperature of the inverters, so keep that in mind. But I've actually never run into a over temperature situation. Here is an example where I was charging the Tesla as quickly as possible as I was trying to run down the RV batteries quickly. And in just seven minutes, it pulled down the RV battery 5% all while the solar was bringing in 1600 watts. Something else I have noticed is that the RV is capable of 20 amp output, but the Tesla, if you set it to 20 amps, it doesn't actually pull 20 amps, it's a little bit conservative. So I have to tell it to pull 22 amps in order to get it up to the Victron inverter's maximum output. If I don't wanna be managing this more often, then I will simply set the Tesla to seven amps and I have found at that speed that it's the perfect average. I'll start at charging, say roughly 10 a.m., and I don't really do anything about it until maybe 4 p.m., and the, the evening, the battery in the RV goes back up, and then the next morning, I bring it back down by when I start at 10, but I'm charging at seven uh, amps, which as you can see here is 1,583 watts. Uh, it then pulls the RV battery back down, and then it charges again in the middle of the day when the solar panels on the RV are producing more than 1500 watts and then it keeps coming back down again once it reaches that equilibrium. So there's two points of equilibrium, one's mid-morning and one's in the afternoon and when those are exactly depends on the time of the year, how long the day is and that sort of thing. As an aside, right now is March 17th, which is very near March 21st, which is the middle point between the winter and the summer solstices. And as you see on the screen, it's one o'clock right now, and the meridian today is 135. So my point is, is that this is the maximum solar production at this time of year, and it gets a little bit higher later when we get closer to the summer solstice, and it gets far lower in the winter. I got into more details about the performance of the solar panels in a previous video where I went over the entire year's production in 2022. If you're interested in seeing that, I'll put a link in the description down below. And now that you know what the charging setup looks like out here in the garage, let's go look at my spreadsheet and I will show you how much of a difference this made in our daily driving in 2022. This is my spreadsheet that I've been using to keep track of all of the details relating to the solar production from the trailer and the consumption of that electricity and the consumption is going to two main sources. One is the Tesla and one is my mini split heat pump in the trailer. So these first couple of gray columns, this is all about the production from the solar panels on a daily basis, how much was produced, how much was used, and whether or not the battery got full that day because that does affect the production since when the battery fills up completely, the production drops off to zero or just, just enough to maintain any uh, uh, loads that are consuming electricity. And then I also have notations if, if it was a fully sunny day, so that should be a day that you're expecting to get the maximum amount of electricity possible at that time of year. So these columns here are all about the Tesla and the electricity that went into it and some stats about that electricity. I don't really have any columns in here about the mini split specifically other than just over here in the notes I put details about things that I was doing to experiment using it and I really like I said only used it to heat the trailer in the winter just to keep the batteries above freezing and in the summer on the really really hot days that were you know over 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit I would use the air conditioning to keep the batteries cooler and also just to burn off extra energy if the Tesla wasn't available to accept that energy. I was trying to avoid the batteries ever getting full because I wanted to be able to see what the solar yield was possible. And if we go down here to the bottom of the spreadsheet, you'll see I have a notation here that for all of the year, only 64 days got fully charged at some point during the day. And most of those days I kept to a minimum. I was successfully able to, you know, like just start withdrawing energy from them as quickly as possible, like when we got home with the car, for instance. So what we're talking about are these figures along here. Now this first metric is a little bit pointless, perhaps. It's how many percents uh, were added to my car over the course of the year from the trailer. Uh, it, you know, nearly 2,000%. My car is an 85D, so 85 kilowatt hour battery, 
And so that's the percentage that that's coming from. Kind of a not really helpful number. Uh, kilowatt hour used. So anytime you charge a battery, there is some losses that occur from the converter that's taking that AC electricity and putting it into the DC batteries. And so this is showing the amount that was consumed from the trailer, but right here is the amount that actually was put into the batteries. And this is all this data is coming from Teslify, which is a service uh, which you can see here, uh, this is the lifetime energy map of Teslify that it's showing me all the places I've driven and it shows me a ton of other information about the car. I'll scroll up here. You can see I can go through all of my drives, all of my charges, calendar. I can look through settings and see all this information. It connects to the Tesla API to my account and it can see all of the details about my car. And so if you're interested in it, there's a link in the description below. You can go sign up and you can get a discount as well by using my referral code. So that's where that, this information is coming from. And you can see for the total year, I was able to put 1,384.9 kilowatt hours into the battery of my Tesla. So the next number you're probably wondering is, well, okay, how, much does, how many miles does that add to your car? And well, we'll get to that over here. Just real quick, you can see that's a 78% uh, charge efficiency, which is okay. It's not great, but you know, that's about what I would expect. Uh, also, when we're charging, I, I adjust the amps that the car is pulling on a regular basis, depending on the solar production. My goal is for the electricity to skip the batteries of the trailer and go straight to the Tesla, so I somewhat try to match it as long as I have some time to, to pay attention to it. And I, my amps can go as low as 5 and as high as 20, and the average was for the year was 9.4 amps. And that's at 240 volts, keep in mind. Okay, so miles added. According to Teslify, the, uh, the, uh, the miles added is 4,600 miles. Now, th the reality is, is that's at rated miles. That's 300 watt hours per mile. And that's what Tesla rates my car as. And if we drove a mixture of city and highway and we were pretty conservative with our accelerations and things like that, maybe we could achieve that. But I have found that not to be the case generally. And if I come over here to the, the Teslify map again, this is a summary of the lifetime of the whole time that we've had Teslify connected to the car, which is since early December of 2019. And so now we're many years later than that, three plus years. And you can see we've now driven 40, almost 47,000 miles with Teslify logging that information. And that's nearly 4,700 different drives for what it's worth. So that's, you'll see here rated miles is 61,000, but we've actually only driven 57 or 47,000 miles. And so that's at a efficiency of 406 watt hours per mile. Now I see people in newer Teslas, you know, Model 3, Model Ys, they get much lower numbers than this on a regular basis. That's okay, that, that's newer technology. I'm great, I just, I'm glad to hear that Tesla has been improving their product. This is what I've gotten. So that's, that's actually a real world number right there. And this is a lot of road tripping, keep in mind. We, you can see it on this map, all these places we've gone. And we actually went on some road trips in this car prior to Teslify logging, like out here to uh, Illinois is another place that we went that, that's not on here. But this, these numbers that you're seeing here are directly reflective of this trip, of, of all these trips, plus our daily living around here in you know, Salt Lake City, Utah area. And so this is, when you're on a freeway, like on a highway, you're going high speed, say, you know, 80, 85 miles an hour, your efficiency is not going to be your rated efficiency of 300 watt hours per mile. It's going to be higher because the, uh, the wind resistance on the car. And so that keep that in mind. And so we've used a total of 19,000 kilowatt hours over the course of that time, all these drives. And that's a mixture of, of Tesla uh, superchargers as well as you know, friends and family's homes while we're traveling and, you know, at our house. And all of that, a lot of these trips are logged in my YouTube channel. I have various, um, for instance, this right here is when we, in 2019, went to Orlando, Florida, and then back through Phoenix, Arizona. That's a, a whole video series that I made. And I can put a card above to that playlist. Going back over here to the spreadsheet. So we come down here and look at this figure now. And with that 406 watt hours per mile, based on the number of kilowatt hours added to the battery, uh, that added 3,411 miles to our car that we were then able to use just driving around town. It went towards actual usefulness in our life. So the solar panels on my trailer are benefiting us to the tune of 3,400 miles of driving. And as well as, like I said, the HVAC system and the trailer heating and cooling it where I want to do that.
The last metric right here is average, and you can see that's day percent start. So the percentage of the battery of the Tesla changes throughout the day based on if we're driving or if we're charging and where we're charging from. Sometimes I was charging from superchargers or from the house, not all from the trailer. So there's a lot of variables, but I wanted to make sure that the Tesla battery didn't get too full, like say 90%, because then I didn't want to charge it over that and I needed somewhere for the energy from the trailer to go. So in general, I would just let it kind of languish somewhere around in the middle range of the battery. And you'll see that the average for the full year was 54% was the average. And because we don't really drive that far on a regular basis, like on a daily basis, that was plenty enough range for us. Uh, keep in mind that would be around you know, 125 miles or so of range on average, around 55%. And that's plenty, right? But on days that we needed more, then I would definitely charge it up more. And this is just an average of the starting percentage of each day. Now that I've shown you all of this information, let's go back up here to the top of the spreadsheet. And I'm going to go down and just point out a couple of notable entries in here that are going to be interesting to see. So as an example, uh, if we jump over here to the Victron monitoring portal, uh, you can see I have February 27th pulled up here. If we come back to the spreadsheet, February 27th, I mentioned that the RV battery went from 97% down to 12%. So that's a 85% reduction. Plus that day we achieved or received 11 kilowatt hours of solar energy from well, from the sun. And so that increased the Tesla's battery percentage 20% in one day. That is a really good day. And keep in mind that's February. That's not even optimal production yet. We'll get into that in some later entries. So if we come back over here and look at this graph, this is from the perspective of the trailer electrical system. We can see that, like I said, it was up to 97%. And then I started discharging the RV battery into the car. And you'll see here that per hour, my consumption was 2.09 kilowatt hours. So that tells you I was probably pulling about 10 amps at 240 volts. And so that was pulling about two kilowatts of energy from the trailer across almost the entirety of the sun of the day. And so I was not only taking all of the solar energy that was being produced at that time, which are the yellow bars on this graph, but I was also taking excess energy out of the battery uh, and pulling that into the car. And then here at around 4 p.m. is when I stopped charging probably around 4.45, 4.40 p.m. And that's why this bar is a little bit shorter because then there was no more consumption after that. And so the battery got down as low as 4%, but the sun then was still shining a little bit. And so I still achieved a little bit more solar production and the day ended with the RV battery at 13% it looks like. Just a couple, like two days later after that previous entry I just showed you is here on March 1st, uh, the RV battery began the day at 76% and ended at 74%. So almost none of the energy that went into the Tesla was from the battery of the trailer. It was all from just solar alone, except for, I guess, 2%, right? And then you can see the Tesla battery was increased or it charged 12% just from the solar from the trailer in that day. So we can come over here, we can see all the details about that day and you know how many rated miles I got from the car in that one day would have been 31 rated miles. Uh, that prior day is entry by the way was 49, almost 50 miles of range in a day and that's rated miles, uh, but that's from both the battery and the solar, whereas this is really just from solar. So about 30 miles is what I can expect to get from the trailer on average, I guess. You know, this is March 1st. Keep in mind the middle point between the winter and the summer solstices is, is about March 21st, which is down here. We'll get to that in just a minute. So let me switch over here to the Victron monitoring portal and we'll switch over to that date. Okay, so here's March 1st and you can see, like I said, the battery was at 76% and you'll see that it didn't vary uh, very much and that's because I was actually ramping up the consumption, meaning the, the Tesla charging. Uh, throughout the morning. So I was trying to match the production and I did that pretty well. And then I stayed steady across the middle of the day as the solar just kind of maxed out. And then as the solar ramped down, I pulled down on the Tesla, uh, lowered how much it was pulling until I stopped it completely and it just kind of leveled off. And so that was 12 kilowatt hours in one day and that added 12% uh, to the battery. And over here, you'll note that that was a fully sunny day. Here's another entry like the other one I just showed you. This is uh, March 7th, so just six days later. And the battery percentage went down a little bit, but not too much, about you know 6%. And it increased the battery percentage 11% uh, that day, or added 29 miles. And you'll see it, I have it marked as sunny. There's always a slight amount of variance of solar production every day anyway, though. 
All right, so here's just a couple of examples from the middle of the point between the summer and the winter solstices. So here we have March 17th, and you can see that we started the battery on the RV at 39, ended at 38, so almost perfectly stayed the same all day, and increased the Tesla battery percent 17%, and we got 30 rated miles from that. And this is the graph from that day. So you'll see that I hit it pretty hard initially in the morning, pulled down the battery, and then uh, my guess is we used the car, so I had to unplug it, and then it went back up, and then we plugged the car back in when we got back, and, and that stayed somewhat constant. So these graphs are unique. They're like a fingerprint every day because of just the usage patterns, and the production is always slightly different. Looking back at the next day down, you'll see I have this one highlighted, uh, a couple of these highlighted green, just as they're good, clean examples of data where we didn't use the Tesla that day, it was a sunny day, etc. So here we have a 29% uh, or 29, pretty much 30 rated miles added on this day on March 18th. And if we come back up here and look at that day, and you'll see it's a pretty clean example of when the sun and the Tesla kind of went up and down together. And you see the blue line is the state of charge of the battery uh, throughout that day. And if we come back over here to this spreadsheet, you'll see that I have here that it's a clean representation. The car didn't get driven that day. Uh, the battery percentage did rise a little bit, so technically we could have gotten a little bit more into the Tesla battery. Right here is March 21st, and that's the exact middle point between the solstices, and we added nearly 37 rated miles that day. And if we look over here, I just have that noted as well as being the middle point, and that was a sunny day as well. So if we go and look at that on the Victron monitoring portal, You'll see that we started the day here and I ran it down pretty hard and then kept it down lower. In general, I kept, I tried to keep the RV battery at a lower state of charge, especially in the summer when there was a lot of production, so that if we did need to use the car that we'd have an extended period of time, as long as possible anyway, before the battery on the trailer got full. But I don't want it to be too crazy low because then it's harder on the battery to be discharged all the, the time. And also if I happen to forget about it and get busy, I didn't want the sun to get covered by clouds and then all of a sudden it bottom out and, and the system shut down. So I felt like, you know, the bottom 25% around there was a good safety margin. Looking down just a couple more days, you'll see here the RV battery went from 27 to 28%. So nearly exactly uh, stayed the same. And we added uh, 29 rated miles to the car and if we jump over here and we go forward just a couple more days you'll see we started here 27 the, it went up and down a little bit throughout the day as we were we, we obviously drove the car uh, at this time of the day so it was no longer discharging and the battery went up and then when we got home i pulled it back down to get it back to the same level or at least close to it at the end of the day so the solar that day produced a total of 13 kilowatt hours now, I just wanted to point out there are some examples in here where, for instance, we went on a trip, but we took the truck and the RV, so the Tesla was just chilling at home. The Tesla couldn't get charged from the RV, obviously, because we had it on our trip, so there's no data for that, and pretty much you'll see the battery over here got full several times throughout that trip because I couldn't discharge it to the Tesla, and we have enough solar energy based on er, compared to our consumption needs in the trailer that it just gets full. Um, here's a trip where we went on uh, in the Tesla to like Tennessee and Nebraska and Missouri and a bunch of places like that in the Midwest. And obviously the Tesla was not being charged from the trailer at that time because the trailer was at home and we were pretty much supercharging or charging at friends' homes during that time frame. And in that case, I just went ahead and turned off the electrical system in the trailer entirely just to not have to think about it or worry about it. And it just kept the state of charge of the battery at a comfortable place instead of it being fully charged the whole time we were gone. Now this is the actual summer solstice here, June 21st. So this is the longest day of the year and conveniently it was a sunny day. And you'll see here that we added 42 rated miles to the car. And if we look over here at kilowatt hours added, that's 12 kilowatt hours that got added to the car in that one day. Now the RV battery did go from 12% and down to 0%. I accidentally let it discharge and down to that. But still, since it only started at 12, that's only putting an extra 12% from the RV battery into the Tesla. So, I mean, I guess this rate of miles, you could bring it down to like 40 miles that we got on the longest day of the year. Now just because it's the longest doesn't mean it's the maximum solar production because solar production is less when it gets hotter and June is starting to get hot. So right here on May 31st is where we had the maximum amount of solar production in one day. So we're approaching the summer solstice down here just a few weeks later but it's not as hot yet uh, and it was a fully sunny day but you'll see that the RV battery got to 100% that day 
however, if we look over here at the Victron portal, you'll see it was the beginning of the day where it started at 100%. So it was 100 the day before. And then as I, the morning was just starting, I hurried and plugged in the car and ran it down really hard. So you can see I was sending you know, 3.7 kilowatt hours in an hour. So I was running it at uh, you know, 3,700 watts for an hour. I did that for two hours actually almost and pulled that in, down hard into the car. And then the rest of the day was just taking in whatever solar yield I got. And then it ended the day like you know, down here at 43%, 41% thereabouts. And, and so on that day, uh, we the amount of solar energy produced at 17.61 kilowatt hours, and keep in mind my battery bank in the trailer is 9.6 kilowatt hours, and so we generated a total of 183% of the RV's battery capacity in one day. So just to give you an idea of what's, what is possible on really high-end days. Now this number of 53 rated miles being added in that day is not terribly helpful unfortunately because the RV battery didn't begin and end the day at the same percentage or at least close to it. So this number is including all of the solar yield plus the energy pulled out of the RV battery. Now right here on August 3rd we have a day where the graph uh, is going to look nice uh, meaning that it started at about the same level 17% and ended at 19% and you'll see that my consumption and production matched really well throughout the day. And so all of this energy pretty much bypassed the battery, or at least mostly did, and added a little bit here before I started charging. And if we look back over here, it added 29.56 rated miles in that day. September 1st is another good example of where the energy was about the same on the battery at the beginning and the end of the day. It went from 18 to 19, and the Tesla pretty much just took all of the energy from that day. So going back over here, we can see that it had a total of nearly 39 rated miles added. Now here's a notable day because on November 12th is the last day I charged the Tesla from the RV. And after that, I dedicated all of the energy being produced to the mini split to keep the batteries warm. And keep in mind, I'm not trying to keep them super warm. I'll get to that later video, like I said, but um, just enough to keep them above freezing. But the solar production in that time of the year is really pretty minimal. As you see over here in the kilowatt hours produced, it's not high enough to send a whole lot to the Tesla anyway. So I just decided it wasn't worth the effort. I know I just, I was doing experiments with the mini split, leaving it on continuously for longer periods of time and whatnot. And so none of that energy went into the Tesla. Down here is the winter solstice. And so the energy production was pretty minimal at you know, about five and a half kilowatt hours in a day that time of year. And so that's about all of the data that I have to show you. Obviously, we've been able to get some useful amount of energy from the trailer, and so I have no regrets there. And we you know, overbuilt the trailer system intending to be able to use the energy for other purposes. And my primary goal is to use it for charging our future Cybertruck when we go on trips, pulling you know the trailer with an electric vehicle. We can go out into the boondocks, and if we're there for several days, we'll be able to get you know, useful amount of energy out of the trailer. And if nothing else, at least we're not losing energy while we're out there. Just, you know, the standby loss of electric vehicles. So right now I'm just experimenting with it. And also I think it's helpful to be able to be getting some extra energy from the trailer and it's helping to pay off the equipment, you know, the, the cost of the equipment that went into installing that in the, in the trailer. And so this is all my experimentation so far. And I hope this has been helpful to see and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.